Welcome, everybody. We're so happy to be back here all together. And as I said yesterday, just being in the same room, even for our folks in, in room A and, and online, uh, I, I think it's so important that we came here together to create a more vibrant future. We all know what we're living with today, what we've come through these past few years, but Pedro and I have been inspired by thinking about how we build a better future together. And we didn't want to start before expressing some gratitude, first of all, to all of those who are here who are not English speakers. We know English is not the universal language. We know in this room there are three universal languages. One is love, which we've seen in abundance over the last three days. The other one is freedom, and the other one is peace. So thank you for all you do every day. And if we could ask you to stand up for a second, and we'll start with that, if you could stand up for a second. First of all, if you can say thank you to two people near you, either by shaking the hand or by just saying it in word, but look them in the eyes and say thank you. Lots of hugs. And then, as you do that, as you do that, there are three, three things. One, the gratitude for the last two years. Two, the gratitude for how special you've been with each other over the last three days. And third, the gratitude for what we know you'll build in the coming years. So if you can give yourselves just a massive applause. On the 29th of July, 1962, my grandfather passed away. My grandmother, Nona, was left with nine kids. My mom was the second youngest. The third youngest is Chicho. Chicho was born with Down syndrome, and in 1962, in Venezuela, with nine kids and a single mother, a child that was born Down syndrome had very limited chances of having with proportionate care from his family members a life that honored and dignified his full potential. And the family decided that that's not what they planned to do. The system had very little support for Chicho. I remember Chicho, he was a big hugger, so I remember his smell very clearly. He had a lovely way of pronouncing my name. He gave me a nickname, Petrus. So he used to call me up and give me a hug. Chicho used to eat a hard-boiled egg at 6 o'clock in the afternoon every single day of his life. It had to be served in a certain way with a piece of round toast and so on. So Chicho was very special to all of us. He lived to 60 years old. He worked at 15 in a pen factory. He went to a special needs school. He went to the Venezuelan Olympics. He threw the shot put. Chicho thrived during his life, and the reason why he thrived wasn't inertia. It wasn't the family saying, we'll see what the system has to offer us. It wasn't inaction. It was a disproportionate approach to love, attention, and care by every single one of his sisters and his brothers and his family, and the connections that they were able to make with the system and disproportionate is a word that we believe is important these days, given the very tricky context that we live within. It's not just the geopolitics of conflict, it's the finances and paying the tab for the last two years during COVID. It's the polarization in society and in politics and so on. And we see you as bridge builders, bridge builders to a better future. But we're going to have to put emphasis in some things, and we're going to have to be disproportionate in some things. We have been asked a question, historically, in health care, which is largely around the six dimensions of quality. And we've forgotten equity, by and large, and we're kind of reigniting that. But we're being asked a very different question now in this complex world that we inhabit. We're being asked this question, which is around the value the value that we bring to society. And it includes defect-free, for sure, but it's much more than that, much more than that. 
So we're going to have to work disproportionately in a number of things. We have some ideas today, and we're leading up to a prescription. And we're going to have to work with an ethos of care. Care for ourselves, care for each other, care for our society, and care for those we serve. So Maureen, I saw a word on the slide at the beginning, eudaimonia. People might be wondering what that means. So eudaimonia is a word developed by Aristotle. It's that old, and we bring it forward for you today. But eudaimonia means human flourishing. And as we began to think about this forum, we started to think about human flourishing. What Aristotle said is that health is a part of human flourishing. So we need, I think, to, to rethink the boundaries of health care and to start think about how do we create, as Pedro said, flourishing lives for our patients. How do we think about people disproportionately who need us in different ways? How do we think about our teams over these past few years? And how do we think about ourselves? So we're going to ask you today to think about eudaimonia, to think about eudaimonia at all different levels. And we have three prescriptions for you today. We want to talk about new ways that we might think about care and caring so that we not only solve a particular clinical problem or extend a lifespan, but that we really create human flourishing like Chicho's life. That we talk about our teams and we pay just as much attention to how we create a flourishing work life as, as well as our home life. And then we're going to end up by talking about our, ourselves. So let me start with the patients and communities. During COVID time, uh, I couldn't get out and harvest in person, so I began to call people all over the United States and all over the world and ask them, what, what is your life like? I, I tried, in the beginning, they knew I was from healthcare and they began to talk about diagnoses. But I had to come back and ask them, tell me about your life. And it was a, an incredible experience for me to talk to hundreds of people uh, one of them was Jackie. Jackie is 24 years old. She's a legal assistant, a big loving family, and she's going to school at Harvard part-time uh, to pursue a career in healthcare. When I asked Jackie about her life, she described having severe anxiety and depression that she's had for quite a number of years. Uh, this idea of her trying to cope with daily life was a struggle. And during COVID, it became worse. So she went and called her physician, her primary care physician. And you all know what happened during COVID, but he told her that he referred her to a psychiatric practice. When she called there, they said, we can see you in seven months. And her desperation was today. So she called a friend who had also been through this kind of anxiety and, and depression. And the friend gave her a, an app on her phone Jackie called the app, uh, it's called Fly, and that day a therapist texted her back and they started texting. And I asked Jackie, was it helpful? She said, it was amazing. The woman not only talked to her about her diagnosis, uh, it wasn't only about medications, it was about what does she do every day? How does she cope when this happens? I said, Jackie, how often did you text and talk to this person? She never met her in real life. But she said in the beginning, she texted her several times a day. Then she said, I began to develop incredible confidence and a sense that I was, had meaning in my life. So then it was maybe once a week, then maybe once a month. But the conversations were about, what did you eat today? Uh, how did you sleep last night? And Jackie is thriving. Jackie is thriving, though she's never met the therapist. She has a friendship, she feels like, a relationship with that woman who understands her as a person. Jackie is flourishing. Through all the hundreds of uh, interviews that I did, I found that a couple of themes emerged that kind of surprised me in the beginning. But one of the things Pedro and I are going to ask you to do is to go back and take some of these personas, take some of these patients, real people, take your family, and ask them the same questions. How is it going in your life and what's happening? And what I determined in these interviews is that there are four things we need to focus on. The first one is tempo. 
I talked to a young a man with, actually he's 62, young to me, um, diabetes, uh, with diabetes his whole life, and I said to him, how often do you see a clinician? Once a year or maybe twice. He goes in with his blood work, gets a prescription, and goes home. When he got an a, a AI um, installation for his diabetes installed, now every couple of minutes his phone tells him how he's doing. He's changed his entire life. He knows if I eat this, what's going to happen. If I exercise, what will happen. Right now, he's as, as, as fit as he's ever been, exercising every day, but the tempo is daily or minutes, not once a year or twice a year. The touches, everybody told me it doesn't have to be in person. There are some people who prefer that, but the touches was my... Uh, my phone or a virtual visit are really doing wonders for me. So tempo, how frequently, touches, how do we connect? The third one is teamwork. They all describe the, how painful it is that they don't have a team, that I have to bring my results to the second person who may or may not agree with the first person, and they feel like they're navigating incredible complexity. We need to come together in a new way as a team so that we make eudaimonia our daily life. And then the fi final one is what Kedar spoke about yesterday, and that was a word that came up in almost every single conversation, and that was trust. We don't trust the current system. They're starting to create new pathways, and I'm seeing around the world some really incredible uh, new models emerging that give me a hope that the four Ts will produce eudaimonia. This is from New Zealand. Uh, this is an ecosystem map. And now we're seeing people uh, in New Zealand begin to understand the four Ts. And so they created maps for people. Uh, this is Tama, he's 55 years old, um, a Maori man. And you can see, maybe not the words in detail, but this is his life. This is his wanu, this is his um, connections to the pharmacy. These are the medications he needs and the rides he needs to various places. When you create an ecosystem map for someone, it brings all the team members together. So in New Zealand, they created a new role they call transition care, transition nursing care. And they're bringing together all of the components of a person and assigning a new model, a new role, and I do think this will emerge, I'm hoping from our togetherness today, that a new tomorrow is gonna to be someone like a transition nurse who puts all the pieces together. When you see how the, the transition nurses work, they're bringing the patient's journey, the home, the family, and they're starting to see incredible outcomes for this. You're seeing patients being able to self-manage in journeys across complex healthcare boundaries that they weren't able to before. Better service coordination, uh, better, um, I, I hate this word, but compliance. Um, they're co-creating a plan. And so of course, um, uh, of course the patients are going to live in a healthier way. So I would say this is a, an example of a model that's producing good outcomes, but it begins with the ecosystem map. And so I would encourage you to go back, and I, I'm working with Jackie now to make her ecosystem map, because all of a sudden, I think we have a step forward to eudaimonia. In um, Pittsburgh, um, Angela Devaney is here, so you can find her and talk to her about a new model of care there for hip and knee surgery. It used to be if a person had hip or knee pain, they would um, go to their primary care doctor, get a referral to the orthopedic surgeon, the first meeting with the orthopedic surgeon often led to uh, uh, an operating room uh, uh, appointment. But now they've a new um, model of care. They call it reimagining wellness together. And what you can see here is that they're co-designing care with the patients. They begin with nurses and, and navigators sitting with the patient and saying, what matters most? They expected, I want hip or knee surgery, what they found in the highest uh, ranking of what mattered to the patient was I need to lose weight. Second was I wanted to manage my pain so my daily living becomes more um, comfortable. And what they're doing is they're focusing on equity. As Pedro said, we really do need to focus on equity in a more visible way. So they're looking at what percentage of people are likely to need their services in the future. 
They're looking at uh, the success of joint replacement, which isn't as positive as we would think, but the losing weight and the managing pain and the exercises is having a great effect. And then they're, losing, they're looking at uh, inequalities in outcomes. And once they start looking at the data through this lens, it's so inspiring to see what um, the outcomes are. But when you talk to the nurses, which I did uh, recently, about their journey, they say the patient comes in and they start with what matters to you, and then they begin to develop a care plan that really focuses and is producing much better clinical outcomes. So this whole idea of taking the what matters to you model into a clinical setting is producing better outcomes, better life, lower cost, eudaimonia. In England, um, there was a, a, a little bit of a frustration, I think, early on. Karen Turner is here, and she, you can talk to her about uh, some barriers, some invisible barriers to asking what matters to you. And in the beginning, people were afraid that if they asked what matters to you, that the um, answers would be not doable. So they we began to do a little bit of a study and found that 60 to 70% of the staff will change a practice as a result of that conversation. Imagine that, that's such a huge number. 70 to 80% of the staff are learning something new about the patient. And just a couple of examples of how the patient's voice is making a huge difference, not only in the care design for that patient's eudaimonia, but really in redesigning the system as a whole. And in the United States, we're now seeing community-involved uh, care. People are coming together, and they're identifying who are the people who have more frequent tempo and touches with the people in the community. Uh, barbers in the United States now are producing some of the best clinical outcomes in the country. In Rochester, New York, as an example, with the black community, they were having problems with decreasing cholesterol, um, hypertension, and uh, getting patients in control. They went to the barbers, and when the barbers, every month when they see the, the person for the haircut, they'll say, uh, can I, I take your blood pressure? They'll take the blood pressure, they'll write it on the amount on a little card, and then they'll say, if you bring this card to your doctor's office, and the doctor's initials are on the card, your next haircut is free. They have the best health in the population than they've ever had uh, and, through the barbers. And the best hair. And the best hair, yeah. <laughs> so we need to, to look beyond our current um, set of professionals to, to engage the entire community for eudaimonia. Pedro. As we think about this, what matters to you question, as, as some of you who are in England who are starting to see the transition to integrated care systems, or ICBs as they're going to be called soon, we need to incorporate this question not just with patients, but with the communities that we serve. Because as you start to work not just in health care, but in health, not just in best possible care, but in best possible health, we need to start there, and our friends from John Shipping and Jane and Jorn and Mats and Pernilla and Jasper, and there's so many of them here, have espoused a, a project called Together. And you see in this triangle a lot of humility. This is acknowledging and accepting that the piece of health care that makes health is tiny. Tiny. So where health happens is everywhere else. Everywhere else. And as we do that, we need to start by asking, by asking the question to the community, what matters to you, so that we can co-design and co-produce better futures. As we thought about a good life, a good life which is part of the outcome of a conversation with municipal leaders, healthcare leaders, and so on in junk shipping, uh, they came up with this idea that it was leadership for a good life, and as we were thinking about images to convey this, uh, and thinking about agency, the ability to act, camaraderie, the ability to be lighthearted when we can be, and coherence, the idea of ensuring that we're authentic and empathetic and so on in life. Uh, I showed Maureen this picture and she, um, and she loved it. I thought, this is Alejandro and Emil Emilia, Ale and Demi. As it happens, and I'll open a parenthesis here, yesterday we got uh, really tricky news with Emilia's health that will affect our life for a very long time. So I need to ask you a favor. There are three things. One, if you can send Emilia 
and her parents and her brother Tomás just some thoughts right now. Secondly, if you can promise me that when you get back home, you're going to hug those that you love even harder, whether that's your kids or your partners and so on. And thirdly, that you're going to ask them, what is a good life? What is a good life? Agency, the ability to act and have a voice, camaraderie, and coherence. That's what we're working with leadership. In London, and Bob, and Dom, and Lara, and Laura, and so on are here, and these are Genevieve, and Shama, and Hannah. They went out to the communities as they noticed the difference in life expectancy between Belgravia and some of the other neighborhoods. 14 years life expectancy difference within the same council and the leaders at Westminster and the leaders at Imperial in their roles as anchor institutions started by going out to the communities. These four individuals plus a few others went out and asked people, what matters to you? What do we need to work on? Crime and safety, housing, and so on. So it's a very different set of answers that you get when you ask people in the communities. And then as you think about care and health and equity, and you think about issues such as age, we've been working with over 2,000 facilities in the US on this age-friendly age -friendly program, where it all starts by asking people what matters to you. The aim is to make care for people who are older the best that it can be by focusing on things that matter to them, mobility and mentation and so on. But it starts with the same question. So Maureen, patients, families, and communities. So we've got here, um, this is your first prescription. We want you to take this back and start to think about eudaimonia in a new way. First, see the whole person. Maybe an ecosystem map. You might make one for your own family. But begin to see the complexity of life and what eudaimonia would mean for each one of these people. Second, map the assets of the community. A lot of people look at the problems, but if when you start to create the asset map, all of a sudden it brings to life connections like the barbers who have such a great impact on health. Uh, thirdly, uh, redesign care with the four T's. Look at how often, look at how you interact with patients and people. Look at how you create teams, like some of the examples I've given you this morning, and how do you specifically pick up on KDAR's uh, plenary yesterday morning and build trust. And then finally, ask patients and families what matters to you. It's not just patients, families, and communities. We're all working in health and healthcare. So what about teams and organizations? So two minutes, two minutes, and the volume will rise very quickly. So I need you to come back in two minutes. But person next to you, two questions. What makes for a good day at work? And what are the pebbles in your shoes at work? Two minutes, very quickly, as many ideas as you can get out. What makes for a good day at work? What are the pebbles in your shoes? Just very quickly. Okay, if you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. Okay, That's, I think we're back. Great, so what, what, if, what if you asked every team in your organization to ask that of each other? What makes for a good day at work? And what are the pebbles in your shoes? Jessica Perlow, who's somewhere in the audience, Jess, was one of the co-authors of the Joint Work Framework. This is a framework with nine dimensions and so on, but there is a method to land some of these ideas on the ground, and this is one of them. I bet you there were at least 10 ideas that you came up with in two minutes. Imagine if you ask the people that you work with to do that across every team in the organization, and then you created a shared sense of responsibility and a shared theory of change, and then you used improvement methods to test out those changes in your teams. For example, in Newcastle, this is the kind of thing that they're finding. What do we use? We use a Pareto chart to try and see what the vital few are. We use the nine dimensions of the joint work framework. You won't be surprised. In their case, autonomy and control, physical and psychological safety, participative management. And then you go deeper into that and start measuring, for instance, from the ideas that were raised, how many have we enacted in Sirio, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, uh, for instance, one of those changes was related to autonomy and control. 
they, they made 93% of the changes related to one of the ideas that staff cared about with some results. And I, I'm showing you a very limited amount of results here, but they're connected to psychological safety, to the ability to have agency and be heard, and eventually to harm and adverse events and so on. Right now, they have 87 clinical teams doing this, coming up with ideas for how to solve it locally. And those ideas together make out what could be an organizational culture. When we talk about joint work, asking each other what makes a good day at work and what are the pebbles in your shoes. When we talk about designing with and for patients and communities and the San Jude's global team are somewhere here, Paola, Naomi, Lillian, I don't know where you are, but thank you for all you do. There's a gap between high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries. The survival rate for kids in high-income countries, about 84 percent, low- and middle-income, about 50 percent. So there's a gap there. Many of those causes are preventable, and one of them is infections. Infections, treatment toxicity, treatment abandonment, and so on. And when you ask staff, based on the fact that there's some evidence, in this case, something called the golden hour evidence, evidence about the treatment with antibiotics of kids that present with fever within an hour. When you ask staff to help to translate that into the context within which they live, they come up with hundreds of ideas. Some of them may look simple or sound simple, like El Doradito, the little golden card. Just one place to have everything that you need to do your work better. They surface the dynamics between, say, nurses and doctors and hematologists and so on. So they work on teamwork and communication. They come up with solutions that help to translate the scientific evidence into practice, and then you measure, and then you measure. I'm just going to show you one measure. We're working on a number of publications here around reduced mortality. And why are they doing this? Because of Nancy. Because of Nancy, who's showing her diploma of courage for everything that she's gone through. Why do staff come up with ideas? Because they care deeply about what they do every single day. Listening to staff, listening to patients, asking the questions are micro-affirmations. They're voices that now you're incorporating, they're voices that you're hearing and you're showing that you care, not just about the outcome, but about the people. You've heard the word kindness repeated throughout this conference in many, many places. Maureen. So many of you were uh, joined us in the kindness session yesterday. How many were there? Oh, a lot, yeah. And so find Bob Kleber. Bob is a pediatrician who is working to lead this work. It started about two years ago when we were getting ready for the forum. In, and then in COVID time, we needed to work virtually. So every month for... Um, these two years, we've had a call and we've talked about kindness. Particularly, I would say that in these two years, kindness to each other, kindness to teams has been really important. To me, this is really, I think, a new way to think about teamwork and leadership because we've got such a fragile workforce right now. You can see that the kindness movement is spreading all around the work world. We invite you to join us. We're still having our monthly calls. For those of you who were in the session yesterday, uh, we have nine little bits of a framework that we're bringing together. And you can see on the bottom here um, how to link into the website and how to get in touch with us for the monthly calls. We ask you to join us because it's so important. It's important for eudaimonia, for our staff, and for our patients as well. As Pedro, as Pedro said, the um, micro-affirmations is critical. It's just walking down the hall and holding a door for someone. Those kind of small little interactions are making a huge difference for people. It's stepping in and saying, let me help you. Um, at Mayo Clinic, as an example, they were having a little bit of trouble because of the hierarchy typical in a, an academic setting. So they started a new process called commensality. I had never heard that word before. Commensality, have you heard it? What it means is eating together. And at first, people said, I'm too busy to eat. So they actually paid money each month, a little bit of money to the doctors, and said, we will pay for your meal if you will eat together. 
and they gave them an agenda, and they would say, five, six, eight doctors, get together after work, or get together for breakfast. And at first, they pulled out the agenda, but as soon as they got together and started eating over a meal, they started talking about what mattered to them. They started helping each other. The microaffirmations grew, and commensality is now a part of Mayo's uh, culture because it says we have to be together, we have to build our teams. These small acts of kindness can have a huge impact for us. So our second prescription for you is to practice micro-affirmations and kindness. Just try it and, and see what happens. Um, yesterday in the kindness session, I was talking about my reach list. When COVID happened, I made a, a separate list, I called it my reach list, of all the people on my Christmas card list who live alone. They're isolated, they're lonely, and every single day since COVID began, I've reached out to at least one person on that list. I was sending postcards from the hotel here in Gothenburg, um, or call, or text, um, or do a video chat. It takes a minute or two, but it makes such a huge difference in making sure that those connections are reliable and vibrant. It brings eudaimonia to them, but it brings eudaimonia to me as well. Ask the staff what matters to you. And as Pedro was saying, solve a problem together. That working on the golden hour and saving kids' lives is critical, and it gives meaning and purpose to everybody's work. So people often talk about the micro, the miso, and the macro, and so on. What about the nano? How often do we forget ourselves? The first, the first person to be kind to, the first person to be kind to is ourselves. You can't give what you don't have, right? So how are we? How are we doing in that? If I was to ask you to rate yourself between 0 and 10, how kind are you to yourself? I'm not sure what kind of answers we would get. I won't get a slide or up, I promise. Don't want to show that. But uh, there is something about thinking about ourselves. Uh, just near here, there's a world headquarters of these beautiful cars. This is an electric Volvo. It drives well, apparently. It's reliable, high performance, beautiful, just like all of you, right? <laughs> In healthcare, frankly, we have some of the most talented, dedicated, loving staff of any industry. But imagine you had one of these Volvos and you had no charging stations. You drive it far and probably fast, and probably faster sometimes than you'd like to drive it, and then the battery would run out. And without a charging station, you just couldn't drive it again. So you have a beautiful car sitting there, unable to drive it. How are we, how are we refilling our tank? Where are our charging stations? So during the beginning of COVID, in the first three months, I started to sense for myself hypervigilance. I wanted to know everything, all the news. I wanted to connect people with ideas. I wanted to see what was happening in Spain and Italy so that we could talk to people in other parts. Hypervigilance. So I started to not sleep so well. I started to eat maybe a bit more than usual. I started to be on that computer every hour of every day. And I realized one day that it was important for me to apply some of these improvement methods to my own life and sit down and really think, where are my charging stations? What am I going to do? What's my driver diagram for well-being? What does that look like? Maybe you have them. Maybe you have them. And if you do, share your ideas with me. I'm really keen to hear. So I developed my own driver diagram. It included things like get moving. So for me, running, playing football, and so on. And it included five driver diagrams and so on. It'll be different for all of us. We all have different ways of leading life. We all have different flavors of life and preferences and so on. So I'll show you two of those primary and secondary drivers here. Do more of what you love. Do more of what you love. For me, it meant a number of things, and for me, it translated into feeding the soul. But I knew, I knew that the rhythm that I had was not going to allow for that. So I figured that I needed to make space, I needed to slow down, and I needed to be present. Be present, just be in the moment, make eye contact, and so on. So I started to 
instill, it's, I started to uh, do daily briefing, slow daily briefing for amounts of time. I started to single task. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> no seriousness. I started to try to drive at the speed limit. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> I started to blog times so that I didn't have 12 meetings in a day. I had a decent number, but diary was under my control. I hear often this glorification of busyness. How are you busy? I'm really busy. But yeah, no, how, how are you really? I'm, I'm really busy. It's like a pride. I'm really busy. What? You're much more than that. You're beautiful people. You have ideas. You have a, I'm sure you're good or bad, but you're not busy. That's not who you are. I started to use a daily journal to write about gratitude and so on, and I wanted to increase the time I spend on equity. I have a concern right now that the wonders of technology might be overshadowed by the challenges that we have with them, with our teenager, teenage kids, with ourselves, and so on. And I feel like people are constantly tapping their pocket to see where the phone is. You know, it's where their phone numbers are, it's where their pass to tap into the room is, it's where their diaries, it's where their emails are. So I, I felt I need myself to avoid the dependency. So I decided to go on an information diet and limit my news intake. I started to reduce the attractiveness of that screen. If you click three times quickly on your iPhone, it becomes black and white. So suddenly it's not as attractive as it was. I started to try a full day without a phone. Can you imagine that? A full weekend or a full week without a phone, a vacation a year without a phone. I started to give myself the time to sleep better, so I built a bed for my phone in a different room. So I put it to sleep. <laughs> night, night. I don't read a book or anything. It's just transaction. And I started to clear the, the screen. I had loads of apps that I never used. So whatever that is for you, Maureen and I want to beg you to be intentional, intentional about your well-being. So as we lead to the prescription, Maureen, I am reminded that you, um, during the National Forum every year, you used to handwrite cards for all the IHI staff. And the last night, somebody used to go to each of the rooms in the hotel and put it under the, under the door. So um, I'd love for you to, maybe as I do the summary, write our prescription just to help us close the plenary. But as we think about ourselves, we, we've talked about staff, families, and communities. We've talked about teams and organizations. And then we've gone to the nano, to ourselves. If we think, as we think about ourselves, be kind to yourself. Nurture your well-being intentionally and understand what works for you and what matters to you. So Maureen, your handwriting is beautiful. People will get to see it. Pedro does love my handwriting. <clears throat> but I do think everything that you said is so important. For eudaimonia, it begins with us. It begins with the recharging station. It begins with really, uh, as we've been telling you, you can't give what you don't have. So you can't be a good uh, healthcare professional. You can't be a good mother or father. You can't be a good partner or son or daughter if you're not good to yourself. So it begins there. But also then, reach out to your family, your team. I'm hoping that every uh, Sunday night you'll sit down and think about how will I understand my family, my, my team members, and myself in a better way. So my prescription here for you, um, the, the, Pedro and I came up with these, um, these things for you to take back from our eudaimonia talk. The first is be kind to yourself and others. Practice micro-affirmations. Just try it. Uh, what I'm finding is that physiologically, when you see someone else is in pain, it triggers a part of your brain that makes you feel sad because you see someone is in need. But when you act with compassion and kindness, when you do a micro-affirmation, when you do something, it triggers a different part of your brain physiologically that makes you feel good. So kindness is not only helpful for the world, it's a helpful thing for you. Second, ask, listen, act, repeat. <laughs> it's not a one-stop uh, one program here, but together, 
if we start to understand what the world needs using quality improvement science, as Pedro showed you from Latin America, using microaffirmations and using some of the new models of care, my sense is going forward, we're going to have new roles in our system, like transitional care nurses, who come together and create a sense of team and touch uh, for our patients, because that's going to produce better clinical outcomes at a lower cost. And last is a co-design and co-produce with patients. It's not just merely um, hearing, reading surveys. It's actually getting them in the room to help you co-produce. So it, it's not a, a, a nominal thing. It's not looking at surveys. It's the real act of co-production. And we've seen so many wonderful examples of that here. When we co-produce, I think we're going to see incredible new designs. And then nurture yourself, plug yourself in, recharge. Uh, Pedro's um, driver diagrams are incredibly powerful. And as he's been teaching those, I think a lot of people have picked up, I have picked up on some of the exact same ideas. So uh, this is our prescription for you, for eudaimonia. We are so excited to, to be here with you all and to, to be sharing some of these ideas. Um, so talk and let's go make a better world.